The secretary here was at Whittier's cousin's house in Danvers at Oak Knoll, and so the, he would have written on this desk when he stayed with them. The books on the lower shelf are what's left of what was in the family's library when Whittier was a boy. And the smallest book on this stack here is the book of Robert Burns's poetry that inspired Whittier to begin writing his own poems. The white china on the tilt top table is all that's left of Whittier's grandmother's china. The portrait on the wall is actually painted from a photograph, the Notman photograph of Whittier at the age of 72. So he didn't sit for that uh, portrait. And it's interesting to see that many of the illustrations we have of Whittier is him with the older man with the beard. Fact be known, he didn't grow the beard till he was in his 60s, so the most of his life he didn't have a beard. The corner cupboard here is federal style, which tells us that it would not have been here when Thomas built the house, but was definitely added before the poet was born. The things you find on this table here were brought to the farm by the poet's mother. This is his mother, Abigail Hussey. The table here is a card table. The top opens up like a book and it makes a square table. Of course, being Quakers, they didn't play cards, but it made a very nice tea table. You could pull it out into the room and open it up. The Bible was hers. It was printed in 1791. This room is the sitting room. But when the house was first built, it was only four rooms. It was this room in the parlor and the two rooms above. It was called a New England two over two. It was a long, tall, skinny house. When we were in the kitchen, that area would have been the backyard when the house was first built. So this room then became the sitting room. The lithograph that you see here on the wall is of Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia. That was about 1838. William Lloyd Garrison and the poet Whittier were having an increasingly difficult time finding a public space where they could give their anti-slavery speeches. The towns would not let them meet in the town squares. Churches were even turning them down. So they raised the money to build their own building. You see this beautiful large building here. The upper level was like a giant conference room, sort of a senate chamber. And the lower level on the street side was where the men had their business offices. Uh, unfortunately, a mob came during the grand opening week and burned the building down. As the mobs were ransacking the building, Whittier was said to have run down the road to a friend's house, borrowed a coat to cover his Quaker coat, and a wig to disguise himself. And he went into the building as if he was one of the mob ransacking and stole his own papers back out of his office. If they would have known it was him, they probably would have killed him on the spot. So this wasn't the only time he was in harm's way for his beliefs. Uh, he had rotten eggs thrown at him at Newburyport, sticks and stones thrown at him at New Hampshire. He had to leave town the back way more than once, and yet he stuck, stuck with it for over 30 years. This room is the kitchen sink area. This is where you'd wash your dishes. You can see that it's a dry sink, no drain. So it's typical in a colonial home to have a window right above the sink. And so when you were done washing, you would scoop the water and toss it out the window. It was also thought that um, normally the kitchen would be on the south facing, which this was originally. When they added the new kitchen, this became the north. So you could have, if it was a southern exposure, you could have your little vegetable and kitchen garden there, the herbs and things that you would put in your soups on a daily basis. And so when they tossed the water, they were also watering their garden at the same time. So this is the kitchen, part of the kitchen. On the counter here, you will see some shoemaking tools, typical of what Whittier would have used to earn his tuition to go to the Haverhill Academy at the first term. He made shoes, he learned the trade from the man in the leather shop across the road, and he sold enough of them, he got to keep nine cents a pair to earn his tuition to go to the grand opening at the Haverhill Academy. The room right off the kitchen is the parents' bedroom. The family called it the mother's room. You see it has another rope bed, and the coverlet on that bed is the crazy quilt style. That coverlet is dated 1870. It was made by the women and Nathaniel Whittier's family, a second cousin to the poet. And each of the women in the family that worked on that quilt has signed or initialed one of the blocks along the edge. 
in the corner there, you'll see a pair of the poet's own boots on the floor. That was the footwear style that he wore his entire life. And it gives you kind of an idea of the size of the man. He was apparently about my height, but very frail. The shaving mirror on top of the bureau belonged to the poet's father. The top hat and the skin cap closest to us belonged to the poet. So around the farm here, he would wear the skin cap, and when he was traveling in the cities like Boston and Philadelphia on his abolitionist business, he would wear the top hat, the style of the day. Oh, Renee, we get to sit down again. Yes. <laughs> it's a great tour, it really is. Uh, and that was only just snippets of it. So if you come, you get the personalized tour, whatever you're most interested in, uh, learn more of the history of the family and the poet. I have many, many <laughs> interesting <laughs> guests. Right? Yes, it's wonderful because uh, a lot of the people who come to visit have a very, feel a very personal connection to Whittier. Either they're a descendant or they were studying Whittier as a child and so they, they come here almost as a pilgrimage. I had a gentleman that came all the way from West Virginia. This was his intended destination. He drove for two days mm. to get here. And uh, he was in his 70s, drove all the way up here by himself. And he came and he took the tour, and then he asked if he could uh, go out to his car and get his book. He had brought with him his eighth grade prose and poetry book. Is that right? And he came and he sat by the fire and he read <laughs> Snowbound out of his book. And apparently this is something he had wanted to do. And so it was sort of fulfilling uh, one of his things on his checklist of what do you want to do. So uh, he was wonderful. He was here for quite an extended visit. <laughs> but then when you drive two days to get here, uh, you can't blame him. I've had... Um, Again, descendants, people who have uh, been descendants of uh, artists of that time period who did paintings of the house. Oh, yeah. uh, I had a man here last week that was the grandson of an artist who had done many of the homes that Whittier had stayed in, done watercolors of them. And so people have feel a very personal connection. And then we just have, we have visitors that are Haverhill natives that come to my door and they say, I've driven by here every day my entire life and never came in. And so I hear that at least once a week. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. And of course there's the uh, Whittier Club. Yes, the Haverhill Whittier Club was founded, uh, I believe 120 years ago, it was actually founded before the poet's death. In fact, that's how they came by having this property. There was a member of the club, James Hayes and Carlton, that was able to, um, when the property came up for sale again in 1891, to see to it that the club bought it, they set up a self-perpetuating group of trustees, and it's been held by that trust ever since. So this has been owned by the trustees of the John Greenleaf Whittier birthplace since before his death. So we're very fortunate um, that it's been kept that long in the condition it's been kept.